Okay, we're ready to talk on thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is really a discussion of energy in chemistry. It uh, primarily talks about the transfer of energy, and this will help us in understanding, to some extent, the driving of, of chemical reactions. Now, we won't do a whole lot on this. Sometimes face-to-face -face I do, but in this case, we're only going to do a few of these slides just to kind of get the concept across. Okay. When we talk about thermodynamics, it is not often in science that we have what we call a law. But in thermodynamics, there are two scientific laws. One of them I'm probably sure you've heard in high school. Thermodynamic law one, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but changed in form and or location. So, other words to say it in another way, the energy of the universe is constant. It's just being changed, shifted around in location and, and form. Thermodynamic two, law two, we have actually talked about in a previous video and also in my PowerPoint, and that is that the universe tends towards a state of entropy. Now, entropy is randomness of motion, and if you may recall when I discussed heat, heat is the most randomized form of energy. So most of the energy in the universe is in the form of heat. As we look at the how chemical reactions are driven, I want you to study these slides here, if you would. Uh, this slide I avoided right here because if you haven't really taken chemistry and you're not with me face to face, you wouldn't understand this. Even face to face, you wouldn't. Delta G is what we call Gibbs free energy. It is free energy, shall we say, that is, has the capability to driving a reaction. If free energy can be given away from a reaction, so I'll say it this way, if free energy can be given away from some reaction, that reaction is exergonic, E-X-E-R-G-O-N-I-C. If free energy can be given away, and you'll see that later in the slides, then that reaction is exergonic. If free energy needs to be imported into the reaction, that reaction is endergonic, endergonic, okay? I want you to think of a simplified reaction of A plus B going to AB. Now, from what we already know, this is on this side of the arrow here. So, reactant A plus reactant B proceeds to form product AB, okay? So as I alluded to, the reactants are A and B, and the product is, is, is AB, okay? I'm not going to use the, the symbol G for Gibbs free energy because, again, I would have to explain that. So I'm going to make it very simple. I'm going to say that the east of A, now this is my own sim symbology, uh, the east of A is the energy possessed by, let's say, atom A. East of B is the energy possessed by atom B. East of AB is the energy possessed by atom AB, a molecule, I'm sorry, AB. How do we know these atoms have energy? Because we have the, the, the movement, the neutrons, the electrons, the protons, and so forth, which we've discussed. Okay. So we're saying the east of A and the east of B, and then this would be the east of AB. Okay, that's my own symbology. I'm not going to get into open and closed systems in this in this particular video, and again for this course this semester because of. So I'll skip this. So then I go here to this slide and I say assume A, B, AB are particles in a system. Okay, the part and the system in this case is, is, is whatever we're investigating, should we say. All right. If the east of A, now this system is open, which means it's open to the outside, and basically what that means is is that energy could flow in or flow out. Energy could flow in or flow out. It's not a closed system. 
So whatever happens to the reactants and the product, energy could either flow out of that system or come into the system based upon what we're going to discuss. Okay, assume that the E sub A, the energy possessed by atom A, plus the E, e sub B, the energy possessed by B, which are the reactant, are less than, that means less than the product energy. So that energy, then in that case, for the reaction to go, you would need additional energy. You would need additional energy. So we'll go to this little thing. Assume that the energy on this axis is energy, free energy, and this is the course of the reaction. So assume that the reactant's energy is less than the product. Well, the only way for this reaction to go is that energy must come in to drive the reaction. So this, this reactant, reaction then would have to be endergonic which means it would have to get energy from the outside to make it go. Okay? All right. So we go back. Then I go to the next one. If the energy possessed by A plus the energy possessed by B, the reactant energies, are greater than the energy possessed by the product, then the reaction can give off energy. It's a... And, to say it another way, it's a spontaneous reaction. Now, let me explain that. A reaction is spontaneous if it already has enough energy to go. A reaction is spontaneous, and as a matter of fact, it has to not only have enough energy to go, but it has to send some energy to the universe. It's an open system. The universe wants its debt paid. So for the reaction to go, not only does it need enough energy for the reaction to go, but it has to send energy to the outside. So to say it in another way, exergonic, exergonic reactions are spontaneous. Endergonic reactions are non-spontaneous. And if the, let's say it like this, think about what I'm going to say. If the E sub A plus the E sub B equaled the E sub AB, that means they were equal, then the reaction would still not go. The reason being is there's no energy left over to pay the universe. So the only way that a reaction can go is if the reaction, reactant's energy is greater than the product's energy. So it would be downhill, which would be this, that here's the reactant's energy, and here's the product's energy. The energy of the reaction is higher, so when it comes down, there's energy to be given off. See, exergonic reaction, spontaneous. So exergonic reactions are spontaneous. Exergonic reactions are spontaneous. Okay? Go further. Now, here's a separate issue. And just take it for granted, because it would be difficult to explain, because then I'd have to explain all of Gibbs-Donna's equation, the Gibbs equation. If a reaction gives off heat as it proceeds, it is termed exo exothermic. So if, if heat is given off from a reaction, then it's exothermic. You can go to the drugstore and buy certain things, where you could crack a little vial, the two chemicals would come together to produce heat. This could be used to, let's say, reduce inflammation or something of this nature later. If a reaction takes in heat from the surroundings, it is called endothermic. So if the reaction, when it's proceeding, pulls in heat, again, you can have some things at the drugstore in which we use sometimes, because remember, at least you don't know, I'll say it like this. If you hit your hand with a hammer accidentally and start swelling, you want to put cold on it. Well, maybe you may not have cold, but there are certain things used in sports and so forth that you could crack a vial, two chemicals come together, and it gets very cold. That would be due to an endothermic reaction. Endothermic. Now, let's, well, I'm not going to get, get you confused in, in the difference, but just take it for granted. If a reaction gives off energy, now no matter heat, whatever, then we will call it exergonic. If a reaction takes on energy, we'll call it endergonic. 
exothermic and endothermic a difference. Exothermic means, and take it literally, that the reaction gives off heat. Endothermic, it takes in heat. Okay. So then we go to this as a review. So I'm not using all the slides. Again, this reaction downhill, giving off energy, exergonic spontaneous, this reaction needs to bring in energy. Okay. So exergonic reactions give energy to the surroundings, making them a spontaneous. Endergonic must borrow energy. If a reaction gives off heat, it's exothermic, and if a reaction takes on heat, it's endothermic. Okay. So that's that's what we will say for now. I will add one other thing. One other thing. The universe is very stingy on giving up energy. So essentially, going back to this, the only way an endergonic reaction can go is for an exergonic reaction to drive it. The only way for an ender... So in other words, these reactions have to in some way be coupled. When you give off energy, you acquire that energy. Now... I didn't put this in, but I'm just going to mention it. In order for an endergon to proceed, it must acquire energy from some exergonic occurring at the same time. The, ne the universe never donates energy. Even when an exergonic reaction is coupled to an endergonic, not all the energy is going to drive the endergonic. Some of the energy is going to go away as heat. You have to pay a debt to the universe. So that's where we get into efficiency rating. For example, if somebody said that your central air is 96% efficient, that means of the electricity coming in, 96% of it is going to run your air condition. But 4% is being blown off on the outside in the form of heat. So nothing's 100% efficient. So my point is the universe always wants some, wants some energy in the form of heat. But an exergonic reaction must drive an endergonic reaction. And to say one last thing, even when we look at, at our food, when we eat, we have energy in our food. Energy in our food. The combination of our digestive enzymes combined with oxygen, to quote earlier discussion, oxidize the food, releases energy from the food. That energy is used to drive reactions that are endergonic, like building our muscles and so forth. See, building muscles would be endergonic. You would need energy. Universe not going to give it to you. So the food then would be that which would liberate the energy. So there's energy in food through digestion, metabolism, and through oxygen, respiration. We liberate the energy from the food. So therefore, that would be an exergonic reaction to drive reactions in our body like building reactions that are endergonic. So that kind of gives you an overview of, in a, in a loose way of how this particular works. Again, on maybe discussions, we can go further.